I'm Dave Mays, and this is Collect Call with Suge Knight. What you're about to hear are conversations, raw and uncut, with the legendary founder of Death Row Records. He's currently serving a 28-year sentence in California State Prison. His honesty, vulnerability, and current state of mind will all be heard in this groundbreaking podcast series, featuring conversations with me and many other guests who have agreed to accept Suge's Collect Call. Suge will be putting periods to all question marks while answering everything hip-hop fans worldwide want to know. History will be made and documented in real time, each week on Collect Call with Suge Knight. Suge and I both want to hear from you, so if you have any questions or input, please be sure to contact us at Breakbeat Media, authentically hip-hop. Welcome to Collect Call with Suge Knight. This is Global Tell Link. You have a prepaid call from Suge Knight. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, style 5 now. Hey, Suge, so it's, it, it's great to hear where you're at right now and how you thinking about everything and the perspective that you you gained um, over these nine years but just talk a little bit about the change like where where were you at you know psychologically before everything went down um, that you know that got you into prison Breaking news out of L.A. A music industry mogul under arrest after a deadly hit and run. There's the January 29th incident where Knight's truck apparently runs over the two men. Think back to where was your mind at then to where you've evolved to now. I was on some, uh, I was on some shit because, number one, they committed fraud against me and tried to fuck me out of my company. Once I was sentenced to come to prison, I want to be my, on my way to prison and be the type of man to play the, uh, you know, the victim role. I have a pity party. I don't believe in that. You know, when you got time to do, you man up and you do your time. So it's a lot of things I had to work on. And first and foremost, I had to work on was getting myself healthy, making my uh, circle smaller have a good team out there. And I felt that I accomplished all those type of things and I even worked on my relationship with God even better. And I'm just not saying that you tell the prison and all of a sudden you're religious, you know. I'm always religious. I just don't follow the church or I just don't follow man. I follow God. But the most important thing that kept me going to understand that I got people that really care about me and I don't want for nothing. And I always say, you know, if it's 5,000 people at a prison on East York, I know I'm doing better than 4,999. So that's always a good thing to have. But he also gave me time to uh, reflect on a lot of the stuff. And I know a lot of things was, some of the cars were dealt to me wrong and or they played dirty pool. Even when it came to the fact that I got a default judgment against me when it came to my company. And even though I settled it twice, they still tried to work me out of it. And at that point, when you're on the streets and life is moving fast, sometimes you look like there's other things I can do instead of fighting for the past. When I got to prison, I was able to get in tip the top shape, get a lot of rest, no phones ringing because obviously there's no cell phones. And I was able to focus on the things I felt meant to me. And I think it was it wasn't a good thing to be able to just let something go that I built. One of the things about that case, I never got served to come to court. And my lawyers and their lawyers is all friends and they never came to court. So that's how I got a default judgment for, for my attorney or myself not showing up. So when they gave a default judgment against me, one of the things was crazy, 
said Lily Harris told the uh, judge that her partner was attorney David Kenner after her judgment. When I talked to David Kenner, he said, that's not true. I filed bankruptcy and trying to get in trouble. I never claimed Jeff Brooks. I never had any, I never had any um, stock or ownership in Jeff Brooks. So the first time we started going to, before we even went to court, I said, you know what, I just settled again. They was talking two million, three million. It went all the way down to one million. So Castleman was Lydia Harris' attorney, and he accepted the one million dollars. Lydia told me that, can I give her a cash tip check for 900 or some thousand and give her 10,000 cash because she wanted to feed, she needed to feed her daughter. So I gave her cash and for 10,000 gave her the rest of the cashier's check. As time went on, they tried to ignore the settlement. So at first, Lydia Harris wouldn't show up to court. But it was a while back, it's still on the internet somewhere where Michael Harris, Goldberg, uh, guy they called a cap and another guy was on the phone and they were saying, look man, we know the judge. We got the judge in our hip pocket. We gonna say this, this the night attorney's gonna say this, and the judge gonna fuck him. And that's exactly what they did. And so she never showed up on the questionnaire. So it was brought to my attention to show them that it was settled and do a chapter 11 and go to court and show the judge. As we was doing that, this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Basically on my side. So one day we come to court and Ian McCarthy looks a little upset. So what's up? He said, man, this dude didn't speak to me because they did threaten my family. and said, I can't do a good job for you. I represent you. I said, what? So I was going to get on the dude. So I told the fool, I'm like, look, man, you know, let me know how to lawyers, you know? And Dan said, no, nah, don't trip, let's go inside. He didn't say, let's trip, but he said, let's just go inside the courtroom. We go inside the courtroom. I'm sitting with Daddy, which is my uh, attorney, our accountant, another guy, and Lydia goes and says, you threatening me, you threatening me, and starts shouting at the top of her, her lungs. You know, like, damn, what's going on? It just... The woman just, you know, the court and said, what's going on? Why is she shouting somebody threatening her? They see, you know, 14 marshals came to arrest me. So Dan McCarthy goes and said, no, no, no. I'm his attorney. I'm sitting right here. Mr. Knight I haven't said a word to nobody. He said, the reason why they saying that, the person got threatened is my wife. They said, your wife? He said, yeah. Michael Harris said some guys over and threatened my wife and said, I keep doing a good job for Mr. Knight. They're going to do something to her and my family. When they said that, they wanted Dan McCarthy to take a deposition with the feds. It was in federal court, which he did. So when that happened, they said it was too too much for a woman judge and gave a man judge. That's when the, the, um, the bullshit came in the game. That's when they, they just ignored everything we was right on. She was going to definitely gave me my company back. So when I got to prison, I started going over all this stuff. I said, what do mean? They said that she filed bankruptcy. And if a person filed bankruptcy, that means if you don't claim death row or another company, you can't claim it later on. Because she had a trustee and creditors. So when I found that out, that's when I started talking to an attorney about it. That's when I even talked to Lily Harris about it. And she was like, yeah, I filed bankruptcy. I said, that's true. Now I get the emails from Goldberg, who's Michael Harris' attorney, the Castleman, who's Lily Harris' attorney. So Goldberg emails Castleman saying, you know, get out the way, basically. We're going to take it from here, and we're going to deal with it. And Castleman emails him back saying, no, it's our judgment. I represent Lydia Harris. Lydia got the judgment, not you and Mike. They said, well, you don't want to have anything because Lydia Harris filed for bankruptcy. And when she filed for bankruptcy, she never claimed any involvement or any ownership with their throne. So Castleman emails it back. They said, well, I didn't find out until almost a, a year later. But as an officer of court, it wasn't 
settled. And when it wasn't resolved, you contact the judge and say, hey, the court to say, we can't move forward with this, this illegal. But neither side did. So when that happened, I was like, okay, let me dig more and get involved in my shit. So what ended up happening after that, Castleman sued my attorney. The reason why he sued my attorney, because my attorney both have paid the money directly to Castleman. Castleman would have got his 40% and gave the rest to Lydia. He both got 400000 Lydia both got 600000 Lydia said that Michael Harris took money and Goldberg took money. But the judge said Givens both gave the money directly to um, Castleman. Well, my attorney both gave the money directly to Castleman instead of to Lydia. So he gave um, Castleman a million dollar judgment against Givens. And the reason why he said he gave him a million dollar judgment because they settled the default judgment. And if they settled the default judgment, why the fuck I don't have my company? To move forward from that shit and make, and make things even more crazier when you really look at it, when it came to the attorneys, they all claim the same thing. This person threatened me. This person was going to, you know, harm my child. Given says um, they showed to his house and was talking about doing something to his son. And they was going to tell everybody he was a homosexual, which I didn't know. So all the shit just went crazy. And that's what it ended up happening. And that's why I turned around and said, you know what? Right is right, wrong is wrong. But I'm going to stand up and fight. So if that happened with Pepsi Cola, Warner Brothers, and Sony, the law said you got to give them their shit back in three times the amount it's worth. Now, also to mention, Cox is E1, which is still in my catalog plug. They hired a lawyer named Keith Bergling paying my, my money every month to make sure I won't get a default judgment. I got the default judgment and Cash the one ended up with my shit and they, they didn't want to end up back to Interscope. Now for Snoop to say he and Michael Harris are doing something together as a team, that tells you a lot of, I'm disappointed in that motherfucker because if you want for me, you'll still be in prison doing life. You turn around and you said you partners up with this dude, neither one of y'all got death row or bought death row or purchased death row. Now it's, it's fun. So what you mean when you say, um, what you mean when you say that you, uh, he'd still be in prison? Because when, when Snoop got convicted for the murder. Snoop Doggy Dog, a judge in Los Angeles refused today to drop murder charges against him. We the jury in a bubble tile action find a defendant, Calvin Brodus, not guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. We had one song on him. We did a video shoot in Long Beach. For whatever the reason was, when I pull up, they was in there um, beating up um, Snook bodyguard with a guy named Big with on him and Snook. I go in and get on the dude, choke him out and get him off from the whole of nine, and another guy from his neighborhood. So when that took place, they said, you got to be standing up. You can't be no punk. They pull up at their apartment. There's four guys in the car. It's Snoop, it's Lil Style, it's Malik. I think it was uh, Sean Dog. Yeah, it was. Got through a gang sign to them. They start chasing them in, in the Jeep, my guy. They shoot. And the guy got shot in his ass, and ricocheted up and killed him, right? So now they got a, you know, a warrant for the liquor for him. Naturally, who the first person they call, who then say, oh, I don't want to get involved in that, but that's murder after the fact. The motherfucker dove in and took care of business. When he got David Kenner, Don Ray, and Johnny Cochran to represent all these guys. I got in my hotel room, and they was all in the room. When me and Bunchy walked into the room, they was all crying. So why everybody so sad with watery eyes? They said, if he going, he getting life, he can't beat this case. I said, why? The lawyer said, well, the bodyguard has a nine millimeter, so we can't say he protected Snoop and shot the guy. Snoop had a 380. I said, that's not a problem. I said, we'll be fucked 
if the bodyguard had a, a 380 and Snoop had a nine millimeter and he got shot with a 380, right? They, I mean, he got shot with a nine millimeter. I said, if the bodyguard had a 380 and Snoop had a nine millimeter and the guy got shot with a nine millimeter, we fucked. But since Snoop had the 380 and the bodyguard had a nine and he got shot with a 380, uh, so all the bodyguard gotta say is he was using 380 bullets in his nine millimeter. And they said, man, you're a genius. You should be a lawyer. So I got Johnny Cochran to represent somebody. I got David Kennedy to represent somebody. I got Don Ray to represent somebody. Now, in, the, in between times of this going on, one of Snoop guys, I ain't gonna say no name, and Snoop know this, he wanted a few dollars. So since he says he didn't give the guy the money, he called the DA. The DA put him with the PI. The PI met with him and he told him the motherfucking truth and gave him some evidence. So what happened, Snoop's manager at the time, you know, she dates the police. The police knew the PI for the DA. They was willing to talk to me because they say he fucked. But this guy is going to testify that Snoop the one shot the dude and killed him. He recorded him. I heard it for myself. The guy wanted to play ball. He got some bread. He destroyed the tape. And that's one of the things. But the most important thing from Interscope, from everyone else that was in the business told me do not waste a dollar on that. I spent six million dollars on that case to make sure he didn't get life in prison. Every day Snoop went to trial and those guys had to come testify against him. It was a hundred po uh, it was a hundred pyrus and bloods out there standing up on that court road. Those dudes had to walk past. So for me to make sure this guy to put my own freedom in state, to make sure this guy don't be in prison, to go back and partner up with Michael Harris, who committed fraud against me, and the lawyer said they're going to try to take death row in this bench, which is not true, but even if it was, you should both try to get it back to the rightful owner. You didn't represent death row when you was on death row. That's just some bitch ass shit. Me personally, that's how I feel. That's, it is, that's how I feel, that's facts. So when you look at that, that would get the police hot on me for doing the things by making sure Snoop didn't get life in prison and none of those other dudes. And so when I got Pac out of prison, that made him even more angry at me. Not to mention when I stopped Dre from getting a lot of time for beating up a gang of bitches and all the shit he was doing, that made me, you know, one of my fair case is behind Dre. Reason why my fair case is behind Dre If I had to do it all over again, I still would do it again because that's the type of man I am. But the other person, I don't keep it, I don't keep it a thousand and keep it against because the next motherfucker, I keep it because that's my DNA. So what ended up happening in that situation, a guy called me and said, hey, Dre want this type of gun. Snoop want this type of gun. Y'all getting ready to go on the crime tour. I said, yeah, what kind of you are? I don't need one. I'm gonna drop my motherfucking Call off and get music put in, we getting ready to get the road. Well, who gonna send me the money? I'm Dre's manager. Dre's business manager is the one gonna send the money for a gun he wants. I get in the business manager number. The guy calls the business manager. The business manager wires the money for Dre some guns to the guy who was giving the guns. A year or two later, On my birthday, they arrested me. The feds. I go to court. David Kennedy comes to see me. He shows me that, hey, I can get out, but Dre gonna do the time. Because his business manager is the one sent the guy the money. He gonna do the time. He wired wire hours and tears behind the shit. I said, fuck it. Could you get him probation? David Kenner said, probably not. He said, maybe. I said, tell you what, either try to get me probation or 
I got to do a year or two, these motherfuckers better be in the studio working. So I got David Chasnos out of Las Vegas that represented me also, because that's where it's from. And I got probation, which I ended up doing time for that. Had nothing to do with me. So I don't regret doing anything for the for people you fuck with because that's what you're supposed to do. And so when it came to getting Pac out of prison, only person made it happen to let me know to get Pac out of prison was a girl named Keisha. That is the baddest bitch in the world. If it weren't for Keisha, you guys wouldn't have heard all eyes on me. All, all the other hits you did. Keisha called my office every fucking day. Every day. I'm Pac White. He need to talk to Mr. Knight. He need to talk to Shug Knight bad. It's life threatening. It's important. It's important. It's important. I used to go to my office and everybody be laughing and clowning. Some crazy bitch saying she's Pac's wife. And so we not, uh, and she want to talk to you, but we don't put her through. I said, let me tell you, motherfucker, something. I caught a meeting. I said, hey, what was you doing before I gave you a job? Do you got a high school diploma? You got any experience? I didn't graduate from high school. You, 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 you. A lot of people didn't, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't working. I said, I gave you guys the opportunity to get paid every two weeks. I didn't ask you to think and see if somebody's Pox wife or Pox, not Pox wife. That's my decision. Next time she called, y'all better make sure I talk to her. She called and put it through. She said, I'm so glad you talked to me. Pac really, really, really needs to talk to you. He says, life threatening, he needs you. I said, all right, he needs to come see him. I said, look, I don't want to tell you I can come see him because I'm on house arrest. I'm going to go drive to my attorney. I don't want to talk to him on the phone. Call me in an hour and a half and I'll let you know. She called back an hour and a half. My attorney said, hey, we can get this shit, but you taking a risk. If, 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 if you walk through that metal detective and it goes off because that ankle bracelet, we fucked. I said, I got to take that chance because she said it's life threatening. I got to do what I can to help Pac. Flew private to New York, had to fly a smaller jet to get to where Pac at, and then take a two hour limo ride to get to the prison. Very first time I seen Pac. You know, we had the conversation, I kept going back. But Keisha made that happen. Then when people went around and said, well, Pac, and, and and people, when people turn around and, and said, didn't, didn't mess you up. They, hey, if it went off, I'd still have been locked up and Pac would have still been locked up. <laughs> <laughs> but the crazy thing about that shit, right? I didn't have to do a deal with Pac because Interscope didn't want Pac anymore. They was giving me Pac contract because they didn't want Pac no more. He was too much for him. Pac used to walk in the motherfucking office and call them all motherfucking the devils. And they didn't do nothing for him when he was in and when he was in prison. They didn't help him. So he was done with them. They gave me his contract. So I didn't have to give Pac a new contract. But the reason why I gave Pac a new contract because on Interscope, Pac probably was getting, you know, after he paid everybody, six or seven points. One point on a million records is like $80,000. I gave Pac a dollar and then start getting $2. So if Pac sold a million records on Interscope, he probably would have made $600,000, maybe a half a million dollars to $600,000. If he sold a million records with me, he'd have made, you know, $2 million. Big difference. If I did a, if Pac did a video for Interscope, and they paid a million dollars for a video, they charged Pac a million dollars. If I did a video with Pac and I paid a million dollars, I charged him a half a million and I pay a half a million. Now, now what, what about some of your other- So I could have always- what, what about some of your other artist deals? Cause a lot of people have, have tried to say that, you know, like like that they didn't have good deals with you or, or whatever, but I, I, you know, talk, talk about, talk about that. Right. Okay, well, let's look at it like this. You can look at their contract and see how much money they was making. Plus, I gave all my artists money every month, from ten grand to five grand a month, and bought them cars and had them a place to stay and paid their bills. Nobody in the industry was doing that. On top of that, even like with Snoop, 
even though I paid all the shit for his court, bought him a house, all that type of shit, right? You can't go to court wearing khakis. I had him, I, I paid for all those suits and did the city he wore to court. I paid for his security, two off duty police officers taking the court, make sure he get there on time. Same thing with Pac, same thing with Rain, same thing with Jewel. Oh, let's take Jewel. Now, Jewel never put her album out. But she had a brand new Volvo. She got a check every month. Her bills were paid. I paid damn near two hundred something thousand dollars for the fat people surgery to get shit cut out, sucked out. And when I did woman to woman on her, right? Guess what? She was eating a bucket of chicken, drinking a fifth of Hennessy. If you take Nate Dog, Nate Dog robbed seven Taco Bells. He must got thirty five years. I paid that half a million dollars to make sure he didn't get no time. Well. Killed the motherfucking man. I paid a half. I paid seven hundred thousand to make she she to do a, a day in prison. People don't know about a lot of this stuff. Same thing with Crump had a case. Same thing. All my artists, including Danny Boy, they was household names before they sold one fucking record. Danny Boy went to, when I was in prison. I gave Danny Boy damn near three four million dollars. Danny Boy said, "Oh." I want the money back. I never asked the shit back. I didn't even talk to Danny Boy. Not, not only that, right? I paid to Snoop an office in Beverly Hills on Beverly Drive with his manager. We had he, he had the motherfucker any way he wanted it. Paid for his employees, all this shit, and never got a dollar back. And at the same time, Dre was signed to Ruthless as a producer and as an artist. He was signed him as a producer for the rest of his natural born ass life. And they would cross collateralize anything he got. What that means is that if they owed him, he was only getting one point of anything he produced. And they had the right to cross collateralize it with anything that Ruthless lost. So if Ruthless, if they owed Dre $5, but Ruthless took a $10 loss, they say, Dre, we're not gonna pay you because we lost money. And if they talk a four dollar loss and they and, and they um, owed him money, they said, Well, we're gonna give you five dollars, but we're gonna pay you a dollar because it was a four dollar loss. He never would have got out that deal for the rest of his life. We could have did no publishing deal, none of that stuff. Not only did I take care of him, he owed me a shitload of money. I did publishing deals with my artists because I had a publishing company before I had any other company. Before I even started a record label. So I paid out my own pocket to sign artists who never wrote one song and did publishing deals with them. I did a publishing deal with Epic with Dre and This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. When I went to prison, they couldn't recoup none of the money they advanced Dre because Dre don't write lyrics and Dre samples. So they figured we're gonna recoup all the money from Death Row, which they did. But Death Row didn't have publishing deal with serious publishing. And that's taking my money. So when I talked to them about it, they know they owe me. This was like Flex, who got a deal with my publishing company, wrote California Love. California Love. Dre didn't write California Love. They still don't give Flex his money or his credit. And we got the proof. Because he got white attorneys who don't have respect for black people. So he saw like the guy to go to Africa and the Africans selling the black uh, Africans to the white man for, for some gold or money and they put them and bring them back to make them slaves. No different. Every artist on my label had a household name before they sold one record. I put a record out. And you can tell how strong and powerful Death Row was because my artists on Death Row was not in the, they not, people don't even consider them in the top 10 rappers of all time or the top 20 and none of that shit. Okay, I just do it like this. You see how many records we sold, so many awards I made sure my people get. 
out of the top 10 rappers of all time, who do they say? Anybody from Death Row besides Pop? Some people might throw Snoop in there, but probably not, not as much. Where? Tell me one fucking time. Now you can kiss ass all day. We're gonna keep the truth, right? I done seen the top 10 list every motherfucking time. It's the same motherfucking people. Biggie, Jay, Pac, Rakim, we go on and on and on. Now you telling me, I mean, when they had that list come out, Snoop been on that list? In the top 10 lyrics of all the times? No. As you see it today, Dave, you seen that list with him on that list? No, no, he usually don't get, he usually don't make that list. Okay then. Let's stop kissing yeah. ass, Dave. You my brother. We're going to tell the truth. Shit. Half of the shit everybody got came from the homies in the studio. You know where we got Big Baby from? 3-2. Yeah. Rest in peace, 3-2. Yeah. I had a group called the Convicts. Mike a motherfucker. He a bad motherfucker. From, from, you know, it was on rap a lot. The, the, the group was called the Convicts. It was uh, Big Mike and 3-2. Not that cop kissing uh, Big Mike, the real Big Mike. So look, 3-2 came in the studio. He said, look, man, I know y'all say blood. Some of y'all say cuz. Well, I'm from in Texas. We don't say blood. We don't say cuz. We say big baby. And he started telling everybody. That's how he started dressing. What's up, big baby? What's up, big baby? Instead of saying blood or cuz. That's where we got big baby from. Not from our camp. From that motherfucker. So how, how, did, how did the convicts, how, did, how you had the convicts sign the death row or how did they end up on, on rap a lot? This is how the whole story happened. I'm glad you asked that question. A known told me about the convicts and said they were good. I said, man, I need these motherfuckers on death row. The convicts and death row, that's it. So I, I fly them out here. Lydia Harris told me, this is how I start talking to David and Michael. I was already talking to Dave. Lydia Harris came in and wanted to get some songs and she was said she was singing. So when I had the convicts, Lydia Harris said her husband owns rap a lot. I'm a businessman. If this motherfucker owns rap a lot, I want the ghetto boys with Scarface. Scarface is the baddest motherfucker in the world, so I want Scarface, you know what I mean? She said, well, you can talk to my husband. He the one who owns it. He ain't give it to you. The first time I ever met Lil J was at the Soul Train Awards in LA outside a uh, club. They said, it's the Ghetto Boys over there. I ran over there because Michael Harris told me he owns Rap a lot. So I run over there and I get on motherfucking uh, uh, Lil J. I didn't even know Lil J. I said, who the fuck is Lil J? That's Prince now. Everybody, Lil J tell me it's me. I said, hey man, um, I, I'm a, I, uh, you gotta give me Rap a lot and give me the Ghetto Boys. Lil J looking at me like I'm crazy as a motherfucker, right? He said, man, that's my shit. Shout out to Jay. I said, no, it ain't. Oh, man. Right? And Lil J, that's the motherfucker who really helped me from day one. Lil J said, man, Michael Harris do not own rap a lot. I do. He said, matter of fact, Michael Harris is a rat. That's why my homeboy is doing all his time in prison. He set my homie up. So I take Lil J word and I go talk to David Kenner. I say, hey, man. I'm going to stop fucking with y'all, talking to him at all. He don't own rap a lot. Lil J say he's a rat. He didn't want to send his homie to prison door a whole bunch of times. That's how we all stop talking. So the convicts were signed. It was uh, um, rap a lot. Let me show you another thing, right? This is what you got to understand. These people have been kind in the industry for a long time. Now, you know who Danny Dane is, right? Yes. Okay. Danny Dane had a big hit record. One of the best records ever. Sin right? Seller. Right. Now, after that, he had some flops and he was signed with Lil J Prince. Right? Okay. Michael Harris calls Interscope and say, hey, give us five million dollars right fucking now because we got Danny Dane's Danny Dane sign. And y'all should put him out. Now, you tell me how this sounds. If a motherfucker gave you $5 million in those days, 
first thing they're going to do, if you say you got Dan and Dane or whatever, if you get Dan and Dane, Big Daddy Kane, any of those motherfuckers, that's good. The first thing you're going to do is do your due diligence and make sure they don't, they're not signing nobody else, right? Right. Right, Dave? Yes or no? Okay. They yeah, did. Yeah, for sure. The, the second thing you're going to do is make, you're going to say how much, how many units did they last album sold? If they last album sold a million, two million dollars, so I'll give you five million dollars. If the motherfucker sold ten copies, you're not gonna give them five million dollars, right? Right. They gave these people five million dollars. Little, little Jay Prince called and said, Yeah, they all got Dan and Dane. I got Dan and Dane signed. Guess what they do? What's that? Deal's over with. But they didn't get the money back. Mm-hmm. So all along. They didn't go to them and says it must be some money laundering or something illegal going on. But why would they do it to me? Because I'm black. They didn't go and get Denzel. They said then he gave Denzel money. I don't know if it's true or not. They didn't do that. They're going to fuck with me because I'm black. But at the same time, back to what I'm saying. I'm not saying, and I tell you, I tell you what. If Michael Harris and Snoop want to say they death row. You have 60 seconds remaining. They, they, they announced that on the biggest platform in the world, the motherfucking Super Bowl and everywhere else. How many motherfucking records have they sold? So far, I don't know. I, yeah, not, 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 not too many so far. You know, they ain't sold shit. Well, I tell you what, they want to impress me. Tell Michael Harris, who they all in the uh, photos in the studio, Tell that motherfucker him and Snoop go to, uh, to the studio and do motherfucking uh, album Snoop by his motherfucking self. Just him and see what it sells. But I wish him the best. I'm not mad at the next motherfucker. Just don't play no motherfucking games with me. Don't act. Don't dress me different because I'm in prison. Dress me the same you would address me if I was on the streets. <laughs>